Uh, hi, I'm Bradley Jackson. I am the director of Facing Nolan. The spotlight of the baseball world is on this man tonight, Nolan Ryan. Nolan's fastball, there was no other sound like it. Strike three calls. Pop. It sounded like bacon in a frying pan. He struck it out. Records are meant to be broken, but not this one. Every part of him is this Paul Bunyan-esque character. He's rubbing the ball. He's staring at you. Look out. Inside. Wow. I'm the sheriff around here. <laughs> Without a doubt, he is the most intimidating pitcher in the history of the game. You hit that guy on purpose, and he goes, George, sometimes you just have to take control of the situation. And there's the record breaker. Everything about Nolan Ryan is rather mythical. This is Big Tex. His legend can't grow anymore. And he was wild. Started thinking maybe this is what I'm meant to do. He had no consistency. He couldn't control the ball. Oh, hell broke loose. When you talk about pain, you learn to pitch with it. And Ryan does not have much left. He looked down and said, This might be it. He was ready to quit baseball. He pitched 27 years. This is as close as I want to be to this guy. Nolan Ryan has a no hit, no run game. How many power pitchers get better as they get older? To have the support from my family, I can't tell you how much that means to me. The seven no hitters is never going to be broken. The man has more strikeouts than anybody will ever have in the history of the game. Nobody's ever going to break it. He just blew it by him. I guess it was kind of like I was born to be a pitcher. This is Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, an Austin and London-based production company making documentaries about America for international audiences. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week, I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. This week, it is my pleasure to welcome acclaimed filmmaker Bradley Jackson, director of Facing Nolan. The film captures the life of baseball Hall of Famer Nolan Ryan, arguably one of the greatest pitchers of all time. His 51 records and 27 seasons across four decades are the stuff of lore. It wasn't always so. Even as the Ryan Express was chalking up strikeouts and no-hitters like no one before him or since, Nolan Ryan was surprisingly undervalued. Oddly enough, he may still be. What better way to understand Ryan's fierce competitive spirit and otherworldly talent than actually asking the Hall of Famers who had to face his 100-mile-an-hour fastball or 12-6 curveball on a regular basis? Stay tuned as we talk about Nolan Ryan as revealed by those who know him best, his family, teammates, and even former U.S. presidents. We also asked Bradley why it has taken so long for a documentary to be made about this living Texas legend. Bradley, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's a it's a, a pleasure to have you on. I, I can't can't believe I'm going to get paid to talk about Nolan Ryan, but more about that in a, in a few minutes. Um, so, yes, uh, remind our listeners and viewers we're talking about uh, the film's Facing Nolan. Uh, did it premiere at South by? Yes, yeah, South by Southwest uh, back in March. Okay, and it's got it's on a limited theatrical release now in the U.S. And it's going to be, is it, if, do I have it correct, streaming from July 19th? It'll be available on digital and on demand on July 19th and uh, streaming probably later in the year in October, November. Okay. So uh, do we have a place where on people can find it on demand? Yeah. Uh, iTunes, uh, Google Play, Vudu. Um, okay. Pretty much any on-demand service, you'll be able to find it. Cool. All right. Well, um, thanks again for coming on. It's uh, uh, I really enjoyed the, uh, the, uh, the the documentary. It brought back a lot of memories for, for myself. Um, but uh, for our audience who haven't seen it or maybe don't can't tell from the, the from the title, but what is Facing Nolan all about? Maybe you can give us a bit of a synopsis. 
Yeah, so Facing Nolan uh, is what we're saying is the definitive documentary about who I think is the greatest pitcher in the history of Major League Baseball, Nolan Ryan, a.k.a. The Express. Um, He pitched for 27 years. He has 51 Major League records. He's a true baseball icon, a true Texas legend, and uh, he was my favorite athlete as a kid. So I'm really uh, honored and thrilled that I got to make the movie about him. I I mean... The thing that kept striking me when I was watching this is that how much fun this must have been to, to, to make, uh, especially if you have any semblance, if you're any semblance of a baseball fan. Um, um, I mean, one thing that uh, you've, you've already kind of put his career in, in perspective, the records, uh, by far most strikeouts, no hitters, some dubious ones. Yeah, <laughs> in terms of walks and grand slams yep. and stuff, yep. but um, the one thing that keeps what I found interesting, and it did remind me of of it brought me straight back to the sort of uh, '80s and even the '70s. I am old enough to remember his career in the '70s, but uh, um, that he was often undervalued. I mean, it's kind of yeah. hard to say that about someone who's the game's first million dollar player. But uh, why was it? Why was he undervalued? You think? I think because. <sighs> That's a great question. I, in hindsight, it, it makes no sense why he was undervalued, but if you go to the specific moments, so mm. when we say he's undervalued, every team that he was on but the Rangers ended up either letting him leave or trading him away and not valuing him to the way he felt like he should be valued. So the Mets essentially traded him away for uh, – it's, it's known as one of the worst trades in the history of baseball. Yeah. Um, yeah. But at the time, nobody knew that he was going to become what he became with the Angels. When he left the Angels, that one was a bit egregious because he was at the peak of his powers. Mm -hmm. But I think the Angels thought that they could do better than him, which was weird. Um, The Astros, they got rid of him because I think they thought he was getting old, which he was 41 years old when he left the Astros. And um, I don't think they thought that he was going to go on to do nobody could have predicted what he was going to go do with the Rangers. So right. there's, there's understand. I understand as a filmmaker why they let him go, but it's still in, in hindsight doesn't make any sense why as a franchise, why, I mean, the, if the point of being an owner of a team is to sell tickets, the guy could still t- sell tickets with the well, best of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, exactly. But it, it's, I was just wondering even too, I mean, um, he, he just had, I don't know if it's, really bad luck, but he always was playing with these, by the standards of the day, they were recent teams. They were still kind of expansion teams. So, yeah, I mean, I know the Mets knew, yeah, yeah, you never played for amazing teams that could back them up. So you have yeah. some good uh, um, good discussions in there too about, um, yeah. you know, I think there was, there was one year, stint. There was a year uh, with the Astros where yeah. in 19, 18, 1987, he was, he led the league in ERA in, in strikeouts, which if you know anything about baseball, if you lead the league in ERA and strikeouts, it means you're the best pitcher in the league. But yet he only won eight out of 24 games that year. Yeah. Yeah. So he was eight and 16. Go figure. Yeah. His team didn't give him run support. Or if you even look, I mean, it's a, and it's a different era, and we can go into that if, if we desire, but I mean, he would have 16 wins in a season and still have a losing record. <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, yeah. cause of all, you know, all these complete games or he'd go so far into the, into the games. So, yeah. um, and then, okay. So you say, you think he's the best, um, uh, pitcher ever. And I'm not saying, I, I'm not disagreeing with you, but, uh, but you know, he's not even some people's top 10. You know, the, you get people say longevity was a factor as if that's a bad word or something. But, uh, you know, yeah, um, there are some people that would even say that, like, oh, he was too much of a strikeout pitcher. Like, uh, you know, he doesn't pitch to contact, um, which to me is like that's a that's a style thing. I don't know. I yeah. mean, like the, the most efficient, I guess, obviously, the most efficient way to get somebody out is to throw one pitch and then they ground out or pop out. But. Yeah. At the end of the day, anytime the ball is put in play, there's the chance that somebody's going to get on base. So the most efficient way to get it, if the pitcher's job is to get an out, yeah. and the most efficient way, the best way to get an out without runs getting scored is a strikeout. Arguably, he's the best pitcher of all time because he threw the most strikeouts of all time. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's it's a strange one, too, because I, I just remember, even at the time, because, you know, you pick up, because the point you make is that 
He never won the Cy Young, which is the mm-hmm. award that's voted by the press for the best pitcher in the league. It, but we, each league gets their own uh, winner. Um, so it's a, it's in some ways a bit of a popularity contest. So at the time, you know, even the media just never really celebrated him. It wasn't until way late in his career that he was this kind of, isn't this amazing what he's achieved? Uh, yeah. But even while he was chalking up all these strikeouts and no-hitters and wins, he wasn't, I mean, it's it, that's why I was even surprised that he was the first million-dollar player. Uh, yeah. You know, because it was kind of, I, it was it's strange. It really is strange. But... You go around, and I guess that's hence why it's called Facing Nolan, one reason. Um, you go around and interview all the legends of the game that went up, uh, either played with him or had to face his 100-mile-an-hour plus 100-mile-an-hour fastball or 12-6 curveball. Um, I mean, how? W- I mean, we've already said this must have been a lot of fun. How, w- how did they react when you approached them? They, were they up for it? Um, yeah. Everybody was excited. I mean, it was one of those dreams come true to get to sit down with Pete Rose, George Brett, um, Randy Johnson, Craig Biggio, Dave Winfield, Roger Clemens, uh, you know, Rod Carew, you know, Mm. Pudge Rodriguez, all Hall of Famers or should be Hall of Famers. And then, you know, toss in a sitting, a former sitting president, George W. Bush into the mix. Um, getting everybody is excited, if you, especially if you're either in baseball or from Texas, yeah. you want to talk about Nolan because there's just something so, um, I don't know if legendary or epic, maybe epic is the right word about him, about his career. Cause not only was he so dominant on the mound, but he was also such a, um, kind of a, uh, a mythical figure a lot of people were like wait mm. what does he do during the off season oh he owns and runs a cattle ranch yeah wait w- wouldn't he just be relaxing on you know in hawaii on the beach collecting his millions no he like ran a fully operational cattle ranch he was on horses the yeah. day that the season ended he's on a horse he's riding around the texas prairie so he's kind of a, a newfangled cowboy in yeah. a sense so i think that added to the myth and the legend as well yeah and I mean, and I like you even debunk one of those myths, but it's kind of interesting how you, uh, the one about throwing newspapers, uh, and that's, yeah. how, you know, you know, we, I think there's a lot, especially if you're from Texas, like I am that you hear a lot of legends and myths about him. Mm-hmm. And so like, like the, the old myth that I heard as a kid was he got, he, he developed his hundred mile an hour fastball by throwing newspapers when he was a kid, you just throw newspapers yeah. on a paper out. And he, you know, I asked him about that thinking he would say, yeah, that's how I got it. He's like, no, I threw with my left hand. So, and I'm a right-handed <laughs> pitcher. You, you have to drive. So you throw out the window with your left hand. And I was like, well, then why did people, you know? And so it's just like, it's subverting the legend, subverting the myth. Cause he is a real yeah. person. He's not John Bunyan. You know, he's yeah. not a, yeah. he's not Davy Crockett or whatever. Yeah, right. So. And, and so when you're interviewing these guys who had to bat against him, what do they say? What do they think about him in terms of being the greatest of all time? I mean, we interviewed in my mind, you know, three of the greatest hitters of all time, Rod Carew, George Brett, Pete Rose. And Rod Carew said, he's like, every time I faced him, I thought I was going to go one over four. So that's amazing. Yeah. Rod Carew talked about how he had to change his stance when he would bat for Nolan because he was too fast. Pete Rose, who is the all time hit King talked about how he was, you know, the most intimidating person you ever face. And then George Brett would still relived a moment that he, I think haunts him to this day where Nolan got him out um, in a particular in-game scenario. And he explained, George Brett essentially said, I thought I was going to win the game. Bases loaded one out bottom of the ninth. I thought I could win the game just by making contact. And Nolan made me ground into a double play in a way that I just, I couldn't believe he did it. And I'll never, I'll never live it down. And so you have these guys that like still remember facing him like it was yesterday, which was pretty magical to capture yeah. on camera. Yeah. I, I mean, it is amazing because even uh, a few others can remember exactly the pitch that he threw them when they either were the last out or yeah. you know were the 
a milestone st- strikeout or or whatever. Yeah. It, it, it's it is like it is yesterday. Um, hey, I think that takes us to a very. Uh, let's give our uh, audience a very early break. We'll be right back with Bradley Jackson, director of Facing Nolan, premiered at South by Southwest. It's on limited theatrical release in the U.S. and it's on demand from July nineteenth. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with acclaimed filmmaker Bradley Jackson, director of Facing Nolan. It premiered at South by Southwest earlier this year. It's on a theatrical release right now in the States, and it will be available on demand uh, wherever you get your videos on demand from uh, July 19th. Um, Bradley, how did this doc get made? This, I mean, it's not every day that someone gets to, uh, or how did you get involved with this? Was this your idea? Yeah, I. Um, it was my idea. It was one of those, like a lot of great... Uh, projects. I think it was birthed out of, out of a little bit of professional jealousy. Mm. I just rewatched the uh, Last Dance, the Michael Jordan documentary, mm. for like the third or fourth time, I think. And I was just kind of seething that I didn't get to be a part of it because I loved Michael Jordan. I loved that era of basketball. Mm. And I was just thinking, okay, who's somebody else? Who's another Michael Jordan that is in my life that maybe hasn't had a movie made about them? And as I was just thinking that, I was just like, oh my God, it's Nolan. Like, yeah. He is he his his records his dominance maybe not the number of championships but just the the sheer level of fame in in his sport as well. Um, so I created a pitch that was very similar to what you see in the in the film called mm-hmm. Facing Nolan, and I found a producer, and we just kind of you know made some inroads with the Ryan family and got a pitch meeting with them, and and um, you know. So, you know, sold the movie, sold it, sold our vision to them. Yeah. And they bought in and, and, and said, yeah, we'll, we'll partner with you and help you make this movie. Wow. I mean, uh, why hasn't there been a doc about Nolan before now? It seems like one of the obvious ones. Yeah, I think because uh, I'll give you, uh, t- it's two words why the movie hasn't been made until now. And those two words are Nolan Ryan. I don't think he wanted a movie made about him. Yeah. Um, not, not that I don't think he's like, not like he's press shy or whatever. I just think yeah. he thinks it's a little, maybe a little uh, braggadocious or a little right. ego stroking. And it really took his wife uh, mm. to tell him that you're not doing this for you. You're doing this for your family. Mm. Um, you're doing this for your grandkids. And I do think there's, there's some semblance to the fact that some of the great pitchers of his era, Tom Seaver, Bob Gibson had recently passed away. Yeah. And I think it was kind of one of those, like, let's get this story down. Let's, yeah. let's make this a legacy moment, which once I think he, once we interviewed him and got him comfortable, I think he was excited about it. Yeah. Cause it looks like he's having fun. I mean, there's a twinkle yeah, in his yeah. eye. Yeah. Yeah. He, and he has a twinkle in his eye, especially when you get him talking about, you know, some of the, some of those old memories and, or talking about, you know, this new era of baseball. Like he likes to talk about, baseball he likes to talk about family and he likes mm. to talk about cattle so yeah. and we talked about all three of those things in this movie so, he, <laughs> so we, you know he was in his comfort zone and what do you think of what does he think of this current era of baseball since you mentioned it i mean you get him talking he thinks that starting pitchers don't go long enough mm. um he thinks that we, they rely too much on relievers and pitch counts yeah. and you know uh i think he thinks that a pitcher, a starting pitcher should go at least eight innings yeah. um, every single time. Cause that's what he did. Yeah. Um, and I mean, he took it as an insult if he got pulled after seven innings or eight innings, yeah. he wanted to finish every game he started, which I think was what made him be the legend that he is. Yeah. I mean, there's, he is of a different era, isn't he? I mean, he's got, um, I mean, I'm not saying I would do any different, you know, if, if most starters these days, if they felt a tinge in their elbow, they would, say, oh, I don't think I can pitch today. What does he do? He goes out and pitches, and he's even got bone spurs or something in his elbow, or any, uh, and he goes in and throws a no-hitter. I mean... Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. his. I think his fourth and his seventh no-hitter, the way he describes it, and other people who are there describe yeah. it, from the moment he woke up the morning for those two no-hitters, 
until the moment he threw his first pitch, he was in agony. Yeah. He was in a lot of pain. His warmups were bad. His elbow, like for his fourth, no hitter, they said he couldn't raise his elbow above his shoulder height. So like to there. Yeah. And he just had that extra level that the superstars have, you know, you hear about mm-hmm. Michael Jordan in the, in the flu game yeah. or, yeah. you know, these moments where athletes are in pain because every athlete, as he, as Nolan says in the movie, some people call it pain. I just call it discomfort. You, yeah. you, you have to learn how to every, in every great athlete, especially at, at their height, they're in a, they're in a level of discomfort. You know, it's like, are you hurt or are you injured? Yeah. And I think he's just like, well, I'm hurt. I'm fine. Everybody's hurt. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just the way he was, the way he was built. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, what is, uh, I mean, what do you think the secret is to his success? Um, I think it's mental, you know, because a lot of these athletes, there's no reason, you know, if you, if you compare Nolan Ryan to another top tier pitcher who maybe quit when he was hmm. 36, 37, I think a lot of it is mental. And I, cause I don't think there's that much physical difference. Yeah. I think the fact that he was the youngest of six kids who was raised by depression era parents, I think that does have something to do with it yeah. because, you know, as he likes to say, nobody was really paying that much attention to me as a kid. So I just like had to like do crazy things to stand out. Yeah. Um, and I think like, you know, no, it, it was never given to him. Nobody ever said, Oh, you're going to be great one day. He yeah. just was always, he just always worked as hard as he possibly could. And then when people started noticing him, he's like, well, this is just what I've been doing all along. Mm. Um, so, you know, I mean, who knows what it was. Yeah. I mean, you could say that even, at, I mean, as we were talking earlier, even early in his career, um, he believed in himself. Yeah. Others didn't necessarily. Yeah. I mean, certainly his, his wife did. And as you've already alluded to, I mean, she's, she's uh, often been a driver of, of his career, hasn't she? Yeah, she is the reason why this movie is made, not just in that she told him to, but in, yeah. I don't think Nolan's career would be as special as it was without her. For one, he might have quit after he left the Mets. Like, yeah. he talks openly about his career wasn't going well, he wasn't a consistent starter, he wasn't a consistent winner, and he just had control problems. And I think uh, there was a strike happening in the, in the baseball, in the MLB at the time. Mm-hmm. And he was about to, he had just had, they just had their first child. And I think he was like, well, I got a pension. I can go be a cattle farmer. Yeah. I've made some, I've made an okay money. I can go be a cattle farmer and I'm good. I've had, yeah. I played seven years. I won a world series. I'm 26 years old. It's time to leave. Yeah. And uh, she said, no, you're too good. Let's give it a couple more years. And that was, the, that was the year that he went into the stratosphere. Yeah. Um, so, you know, without, without her, we're not, we're not talking, you and I are not talking. Yeah. No, it's a, uh, I mean, she comes, she's, she's amazing. There's great, you've got great archive too. I love the, the stuff from like the seventies and stuff that, yeah. uh, you know, um, and, and just following their, their life together. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but you, you were also talking about, you know, what is it like working with, one of your idols and <laughs> in, in a legend in trying to make a film. I mean, what is, what's Nolan like trying to get a film made? I mean, I thought, I love the bit at the end where you show him, he did a bit on a soap opera one time, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, he's, he's definitely not a, um, he's not somebody that seeks to be in front of the camera. Yeah. So there were definitely moments where we kind of had to be like, come on, let's, this will be good. It'll be annoying for, 10 minutes, then you'll forget the cameras there and then it'll go well. Like, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't want to be, he doesn't want to have a microphone put on him. <laughs> um, that kind of a thing. Yeah. But he's very, if you, I feel like if you explain the process to him, he gets it. Um, mm. And, you know, he, I think he was more nervous, um, you know, us interviewing him than he was, you know, starting a game at Yankee stadium. Like Probably. that's kind of the vibe. He's not, he, so he's not somebody that loves to be in front of the camera, but yeah. he's just so interesting. He's just got, he's just led the most interesting life. So anytime he opens his mouth, you sit forward and listen. Yeah. 
I mean, one thing is you didn't. I mean, you didn't even touch on his post playing days, but he had yeah, a proper that was a choice. We yeah. we we just felt like there was too much that could have been its own movie. Yeah, what he did with the Rangers, um, and there's a there's an early cut of the movie where we just kind of briefly discussed it, mm. and we we screened it for some people, and they were just like, it just is too. It opens up too many more questions, and it makes me like I th- my, my hope is that people when they if you don't know that much about Nolan or Ryan and you watch this movie and you're mm. fascinated, which we hope you are, you'll go and you'll go and open up YouTube. You'll go and do some digging. You'll read mm. a couple of the books that have been written about him. Um, and I think it's just because he, he's done so many more, like you mentioned in the soap opera, like I was, I was multiple days into filming the documentary about him and I didn't know he was in a soap opera. <laughs> and, you know, I considered myself an expert on him and I didn't know he was in a soap opera. So oh, yeah. Um, there's all these little interesting things about him. So, yeah. Yeah. And, um, quite, I mean, as you've already mentioned, Pete Rose plays a big part in this, uh, yeah. in this film and it's, it's great to see him. Um, now for those who don't know, um, Pete Rose has his own interesting history and he's, uh, you know, currently, I think he's the only player actually literally banned, uh, f- officially from baseball in the hall of fame. I mean, uh, but they do these events together where they reminisce and talk about their playing days. Um, I mean, what, is, what does Nolan think about the whole Pete Rose situation? Is that something that came up? Yeah, no, Pete, he thinks Pete should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like you ask him, he would, he would give you that answer to your face. Like, there's no secret yeah. that Nolan, now he jokingly says that Pete would run over his own mother to score a run. Well, he probably um, would. <laughs> he would, yeah. yeah. I mean, he said that, like, Pete, I think, you know, the way I like to think of it, Nolan was the most inwardly um, competitive person, and Pete was the most outwardly competitive person. Mm. Um, you know, Pete's going to run over somebody just to score a run. Nolan's going to keep it in, but he's going to do it. Like, they're, they're the same, but just a little different. That's what I think. That's why I think they get along so. Yeah. Oh, well, there's some great scenes you've got where you talk, Nolan, about talking about pitching uh inside you know yeah yeah uh, i think he just you know he that's another thing he'll get on about the pitchers today is like you don't they don't throw inside because they're afraid of hitting somebody whereas in nolan's day i think it was you know you hit people maybe sometimes <laughs> maybe sometimes it was on purpose uh, most of the time most of the time it probably wasn't but sometimes uh, it probably was yeah and Nolan kind of like that was just he came with the territory in baseball. And of course, I mean, we couldn't do a podcast about uh, facing Nolan or Nolan Ryan himself without talking about the uh, the Robin Ventura um, uh, yes. incident. I mean, how the do you legendary legendary you, moment? Yes. Yeah, which uh, made many Texans proud. I can tell you. But anyway, how did you how did you handle it? Yeah. Well, I mean. He he like he laughs about it because he he says he goes I think it's the first question everybody wants to ask but it's always the third or fourth or fifth question yeah. they do ask yeah but you know obviously you have to talk about it because it it somehow has taken on it's a life of its own mm. it was kind of the first like viral sports moment maybe mm. um, but I'm really proud of the way we do it in the movie because I think we I think there's a really there's a couple of great payoffs in it. And, and, and I also think we cover it in a way that hasn't been done before. I think yeah. we provide the right amount of context of not just why it happened, but also why Nolan reacted the way that he did. Yeah. Um, and so in my mind, I think it is kind of the, um, it's probably the most crowd pleasing moment in the whole film. Mm. Um, we screened it at Ranger stadium um, this wow. year after a game, the Rangers played the, uh, the Braves um and the, we screened the movie afterwards to about eight eighty five hundred to ten thousand fans and when that moment happened everybody just applauded so yeah, it was yeah. definitely one of those like larger than life moments which mm-hmm. makes sense because no one is a larger than life figure what i can say because i know we we want to audiences to see this for themselves what i can say is there were some out there were some there's some, some background to this story that i was not aware of and I thought it was yes. very, very interesting. And, and a coincidence, it's just incredible, actually. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. we'll leave it at that. Um, you also, um, I, 
I really so liked you uh, talking with Roger Clemens, who I think is, uh, in many ways, a very similar pitcher to Nolan, uh, Texan power pitcher. He also has some of the, um, for me personally, uh, a scene that really resonated was him talking about sneaking into the Astrodome and watching uh, Nolan Ryan uh, warm up. And I, I can say, I've actually seen Ryan pitch in person. Mm. I went to uh, Astrodome. I saw him pitch in the late 80s against Danny Cox of the Cardinals. And we got there early, and we went down towards the field because in those days the bullpen was essentially right along the uh, first uh, the first base, uh, you know, that line. And uh, the sounds that they – the guys all talked about the sounds that his pitches made. Mm-hmm. I, I hadn't I – had, I had completely forgotten it, but it's exactly right. I mean, it yeah. was just absolutely amazing. And it was just us, all us kids, just all along there on the rail. Just – that was more exciting than the game in many ways. Yeah. Something magical about baseball, isn't there? Yeah. And what about Clemens? I mean – what is, does Ryan say? Any, have a view on that? Because Clemens seems to, not officially, but he's kind of been. I mean, we if anyone's got I've stats never, for the uh, for the Hall of Fame, yeah, right. I've never talked to him about Clemens. I would I would think he might say the same thing. I don't know. Um, yeah. I mean, I think he I think he thinks uh, you know Roger is one of the great pitchers of all time, mm. um, and is you know I think if you're going to say the successors to Nolan Ryan, it's Randy Johnson and Roger Clemens. Yeah. Um, I think are the two logical successors to him. Um, But yeah, I mean, you know, hearing about Roger Clemens as a kid sneaking into the Astrodome just to me was just such a special little moment Mm -hmm. Um, because also like, you know uh, it's, it's funny. There's like some weird parallels in their career they're both, you know, they're both power pitchers. They're both from Texas. They both played for an incredibly long time. Their records are somewhat similar, but the two things, the weird parallel that I love is that like Nolan Ryan famously won zero Cy Young awards, but he has, <laughs> but he has seven no hitters. <laughs> right. And Roger Clemens famously won seven Cy Young awards, but somehow has zero no hitters. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like this weird, like, juxtaposition like it feels like maybe no one should have five no hitters and two Cy Youngs and Clemens should have two no hitters and five Cy Youngs I don't know but it it is just wild however the universe balances itself yeah Yeah. exactly Um, but I mean one thing we haven't and you mentioned at the beginning and as someone who's I was born and raised in Texas um I mean, maybe you can. What does what does Nolan Ryan mean to the state of Texas? Because a lot of people who are listening or watching this do not. Re- I mean, they know they may know Nolan's famous, but I mean, he is absolutely. He yeah. could have ran for governor if he wanted to. Yeah, he? he could have. He is, in my mind, he is the most famous athlete from Texas who played in Texas. I mean. Right. I guess you could maybe say Lance Armstrong has more international fame, but it's not necessarily mm. for good reasons. Right. Um, and, you know, I mean, I guess maybe you argue Dirk Nowitzki, but Dirk's not from Texas. I, yeah. I can't think of a more, an athlete who is associated with a state more specifically than Nolan is with, with Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Michael Jordan was Chicago uh, and Illinois, yeah. but like, Michael Jordan's from North Carolina. Exactly. So it's yeah. just kind of like this. Um, in Texas, I mean, like everybody talks about Texas and love for, for football, but it's the same for baseball. Yeah. I think everybody thinks about Friday night lights, but the lights also apply to baseball. Um, yeah. We love our baseball in the state of Texas. So, yeah. um, and he just represents what Texans want to represent, you know, like, you know, kind of that maybe that's why the Robin Ventura thing resonated so much was because, you know, he's this kind of old, old guy who is defending his, his turf a little bit. And I think yeah. that's what Texans maybe, maybe look to. Yeah. I mean, he looked like he was right in a rodeo when he just does that headlock on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was, he was roping him like he was roping a baby calf. Is what Roger it, it, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, I mean, this is all great, but how do you, I mean, did you just literally just call up the ex-president of the United States and say, would you talk to us about Nolan Ryan? I didn't call him, no. <laughs> Nolan Ryan Nolan Ryan called him. 
Yeah. Um, no, I mean, like, I think it's one of those things where if Nolan or somebody in his family pick up the phone and say, hey, can you put us on the schedule on your books to like talk about about Nolan? Yeah. Ninety nine percent of the time, the person's going to say, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. The only person who really who really turned us down was Sandy Koufax. Interesting. And that's only because Sandy Koufax doesn't do interviews. Right. He just, we, he just famously does not do interviews. Yeah. yeah. So. Actually, that's an interesting. One thing I came up late didn't hadn't realized, but because don't you have Jeff Torborg who's on in the yes. film? He yeah. caught a, one of Koufax's no hitters, and he caught one of yeah. Ryan's. Did he say anything? Yeah. Did you? I don't think it's in the film, but did he say anything about uh, uh, comparing the two at all? Yeah, he did. You know, he talked about that's a great you know, it's a great little baseball connection. Um, yeah, you know, Torborg. Uh, is a legend in that he definitely caught Ryan and Koufax. Um, and I think he saw he, what Torborg did that was so amazing was I think he saw that Ryan had a little bit of Koufax in him mm. and he, he and their pitching coach at the time figured out what was wrong with Nolan. Cause Nolan was like, cause everybody thinks, Oh, Koufax was this legend, which he was, but Koufax was similar to Nolan that the first five four to five years of his career, he was a little wild. He was mm. a little, he wasn't the dominant person. And then when he put it all together, then yeah. he became yeah. this legend. And, uh, and so that's exactly what happened to Nolan. It took him five, yeah. six years, and then he became the legend. So that was cool to get Torborg's yeah. perspective on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but back to, uh, so you got to, so you go, do you, do you rock up to George Bush's house and with a cr- crew and just, uh, <laughs> how does we had that, to do it? Yeah. We had to, we had to get a pretty hefty background check done by the secret service. Yeah. Um, but thankfully we passed and uh, we, <laughs> we did it at his presidential library in Dallas. Yeah. Okay. And we were told, um, he was the only person that I shared the questions with beforehand because his, yeah. his team demanded it. Mm. And, um, he get, like we wanted an hour. They gave us thirty minutes, but we used every thirty, every single minute of that thirty minutes. Yeah, and he was just exactly what you want him to be, you know. Especially because we're not talking about politics. Yeah, yeah. talking baseball, and uh, you know, he he got to relive some of the great moments of being, you know, former owner of the Rangers and being good friends with Nolan. And he, you know, he was there for the five thousand strikeout. He was there for the Robin Ventura moment. Mm. So he was there as a as an owner of the team but also as a friend it was pretty cool because they're about the same age aren't they they're they're basically yeah, contemporaries I think, I, think, uh, I think but w might be like one year younger or something like that but yeah, yeah. they're very it's similar amazing. in age. yeah uh, well it's i mean for i mean you don't have to be a baseball fan to enjoy this uh i, I would but it certainly for me it was a walk uh, waltz down memory lane so thank you so yeah. much for everything you've done uh for bringing this to the to the big screen um what's next for you are you gonna i know you've got a quite a varied uh, career in filmmaking are you gonna stick with docs uh what do you what, what do you have in the works yeah i just um i just finished writing a sports uh, basketball screenplay for imagine entertainment which is ron howard and brian grazer's company so Hopefully that'll get made. We'll see. But okay. it's a it's a it's a bas- a boot movie around centered around basketball. And then um, in the documentary space, I'm producing a documentary about the um, the Millie Vanilli story from the uh, '90s. Um, so uh, that one, you know, may- maybe I'll come on to your show this time next year when that movie's out. We can talk about that. Cause that's a that's a wild story in and of itself. I think it is because I don't. There, there hasn't been another doc about them, has there? Because there's something that came out because I saw some stuff that I didn't know about them, and it made me. I found them yeah. very intriguing when I wasn't. I hadn't previously. Yeah, it's been. more than just. It's more than just what what you kind of see in you know the back of the uh, and the trivia question that is you know Millie Vanilli. I feel like a lot of it nowadays is like boiled down to a trivia question which it's yeah. there's so much more there yeah it's not just two guys decided to lip sync it's there's yeah. a, a a tangled web and it's fascinating and it's funny and it's tragic and it's sad yeah. and it's really entertaining yeah. well you i mean so you've got this uh well, I, don't, I don't know how unique but you've definitely got a unique perspective as a, someone who's a screenwriter also a director and and i mean it's uh it's it's interesting what do you you must be you have this eye for for a good story 
and then finding it. I mean, Nolan seemed like an obvious one, but something like Milli Vanilli or 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 or, um, or what other great docs do, which is maybe sh- shed a new light or pr- bring a story that's just you know better than fiction in many cases. Yeah, to me, it's like it's, if it's um, if it's a screenplay idea or if it's a documentary. It needs to, I feel like it needs to have lived in my head for at least a couple of weeks and I don't forget about it. That's right. kind of one of those things where it's like, if you can't, if you can't shake an idea, then that usually means it's worth pursuing. And, you know, Millie Vanilla, Nolan was one of those ones where it popped into my head and it's, it wasn't like I'd been dreaming of a Nolan Ryan documentary from yeah. day one, but it popped in my head and I was like, well, this is a no, if, if we can do this, it's a no brainer. Yeah. The Mill of Vanilli one was one that had been in my head for probably 10 years. Um, <laughs> because, you know, there was the behind the music that was made about them on VH1, but there really hasn't been a true definitive right. telling of what actually happened. Yeah. And, you know, that's one that the fact that we get to make that is is definitely very exciting. Yeah. And those behind the music ones are a bit... Uh, yeah, they're a bit dated. <laughs> and, and cursory and kind of... Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, definitely. I mean, I, I did see that. I, I saw that on your IMDb profile. I have to say, I don't ask those questions anymore because half the time I would ask people about it and they would say, oh, I'm not making that movie or I don't know what you're talking yeah, about yeah, or yeah. it hasn't been announced yet. Uh, yeah. But uh, no, that's uh, I definitely uh, we would love to have you on again because I think that's uh, yeah. that's going to be another uh, another great talk. So thanks again so much. Uh, of course. Uh, Bradley Jackson, director of Facing Nolan. Premiered at South by Southwest earlier this year. It's in theaters in the U.S., and you can get it on demand from July 19th. So, Bradley, thanks again. It's been a joy talking with you. Thank you so much for having me on. All right. Take care. Thank you. I'd like to give a shout-out to Sam and Joe Graves at Intersound Audio in Eskrick, England, in deepest, darkest Yorkshire. A big thanks to Nevin Apanovich, podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show. And finally, a big thanks to our listeners. As always, we love to hear from you, so please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas. You can reach out to us on YouTube, social media, or directly by going to our website, www.factualamerica.com and clicking on the Get In Touch link. And as always, please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.